Hi guys, I wanted to take a minute to describe for you how convolution works in kind of a, a visual way. I've been struggling as we've been working on this for the last week or so, um, more than a week or so, I guess, uh, to, to at the whiteboard to sort of explain what's going on. So I thought I would try to cook up some kind of a an animation that at least shows the, the mechanical process of calculating a convolution. I want to remind you that the idea of convolution is that you think of the input signal x of t as, a, as being superposed impulses. In other words, it's the superposition of a bunch of impulses. And then the impulse response tells you what would be the response of the system to a single impulse. And convolution is basically calculating the superposition of <coughs> the beginning of the impulse response, the immediate part of the impulse response that corresponds to an impulse happening now, plus the impulse response for an impulse that happened a little bit ago, times the delayed impulse response, that's the delayed a little bit ago, and then plus the signal that came in a, a little bit longer ago, times the delayed impulse response a little bit longer, um, and so on. So you, you imagine there are each impulse that comes in produces an impulse response, and its contribution to the output now is uh, delayed by how long it's been since the input had that magnitude. So the point is this: if you uh, let's see, here here's what the impulse the impulse response is the green guy here, and the signal coming in is the blue guy. Now, if I let's see, um, can I do that? Hmm. I see, I don't have I to the 12. Let's go to section two. So what I do to get the delay, I flip the impulse response <clears throat> and then I slide it forward. So here we're looking at t equals zero. This means the signal hasn't even started yet or it just started. And so the impulse is just beginning. The impulse response from the beginning of the signal is, is just starting and there's really no overlap at this point. So then we uh, imagine sliding forward in time and then what I should do here let's see if I can do this here we go so the impulse now the signal coming in now has this much height and I'm going to multiply that by the impulse response now so that's one and a half times two that'll get me up to three so I'm going to get a contribution of in relative size three from the beginning. And then if I go back a little bit in time, the signal a little bit ago was one and a half, and I had um, an impulse response delayed from that much time of two, and that's going to give me a three. And notice that repeats till I get to here. And now here is what the impulse response looks like, a delay of half a second ago, say. It's still a two. And so the contribution uh, from the part of the signal that's happened between zero and half a second, that's half a second, is the area, this area under this curve. Now I don't have to worry about the impulse response over here because that's delayed, remember, from the original impulse response. Uh, that's this one. Um, it's flat for two whole seconds. In other words, if you have a single impulse, the output will stay high for two seconds before it falls off. And so if I go back to the third picture, um, but it's only been half a second. So this doesn't really matter because it's more than half a second ago and the, there was no signal more than half a second ago. So I don't know. I hope that that kind of makes sense. Let's let's look at a simulation. What What's this going to actually look like? So I've got here, uh, here's the signal. Here's the impulse response. It's flipped about the uh, vertical axis, and it's shifted in time. So here we're looking at t equals negative 1. And notice the signal hasn't even started yet, and so there's no output at this time. But as time goes on, as soon as time gets to uh, 0, there's going to start to be an output, and the area under that overlap is starting to go up. So you'll see the overlap between the impulse response and the signal is getting bigger as time goes on. And the area is the yellow, the yellow dot is measuring the total area under the curve. 
it's going to go up until t equals 1. At t equals 1, it's going to become flat. Why? Well, because the overlap area isn't going to increase anymore. It stays constant. And so as long as the impulse response is still covering the, in, the signal, it'll stay constant. But what's going to happen after, when does this happen? At two seconds. At two seconds, it will be uh, one second since the signal ended and the, the uh, <clears throat> because the impulse response is only two seconds long, uh, we're gonna, the output is going to start dropping because it's been more than two seconds since the signal began. Does that make sense? And so, and the, the signal ended at one second. So that means the overlap is getting uh, less complete. Time goes on until we get to three seconds. By three seconds, even the very end of the input signal, which ended at one second, is still, is no longer producing any output because the impulse response only lasts for two seconds. And so at three seconds, there's no overlap between the impulse response and the signal, and the output goes to zero. And then it just stays zero. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, notice, let me go back here. As long, it's only when there's an overlap between the impulse response sliding, the inverted in, or flipped impulse response sliding across the input. As long as there's overlap, there's an output, but eventually the overlap goes to zero and we get nothing. So that's the signal. The other thing to notice is that the height of this guy is two. The height of this guy is one and a half. The width of this guy is 1, so you take 1 times 1 and a half times 2, and that gives you 3. So that's why the output goes to 3. Anyway, I hope that uh, animation helps clarify what's going on. We'll watch it one more time. Very exciting. It was actually rather painful to create, but, uh, but I hope it helps. Anyway, we'll talk to you guys soon. Uh, take care.